All right, so Mirko, the mic is yours. Okay, so um, welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, I guess that we have also um, people from Italy, so benvenuti e benvenuta. Uh, buonasera, buongiorno if you are in Canada. Um, I think that it's, well, I'll, I'll just say this in English. It's a very um, shorter sort of um, introduction to the meeting today. This is the final meeting of this edition of the um, workshop in creative uh, writing uh, with Leicia Canton. Uh, the title of, the, uh, of this um, workshop um, was um, Writing in a Safe Space. And uh, the first thing that I would like to do is to bring the greetings of the coordinator of the uh, BA program in Modern Languages and Cultures and MA program in Modern uh, Literatures and Cultures, um, Anna Francesca Nakarato. Professor Nakarato wanted to be here to greet you all, um, but she has had a, another institutional commitment so she couldn't make it but uh, she asked me to, to say hello. Um, well, uh, I don't know if I should start with the thank yous first uh, and then maybe a few words on the, on the uh, workshop. So uh, yeah, uh, I would like to thank uh, Licha for her uh, wonderful uh, job that, well, that you made with, with our students. Um, we have 12 students from the uh, department of the, uh, of you humanities of the University of Calabria here uh, presenting their uh, projects, readings, their stories um, as the, the, the final um, uh, meeting, as I was saying before, of this workshop so that they, uh, they've worked with, with Licha Canton for a month and a half, more or less, uh, seven meetings. They started thinking about the stories and uh, projects and now they're here to um tell us everything about them so thank you Licha for uh, what you did with our students but also thank you uh, uh the department I would like to thank the department um my department the department of humanities of the University of Calabria um for welcoming and supporting this activity which is part of our um uh, professional initiatives for our students as well. I would like to thank Ilan for, for hosting us. That's very generous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and also for giving us the opportunity to, to well, reach uh, an international audience as well. That's very great. And uh, last but not least, of course, thank you uh, to all the students, uh, to the 12 students that actually uh, are here with us today. Thank you for participating in this project with such enthusiasm and for sharing your creativity with us and also for the commitment, uh, your commitment, despite, of course, the, uh, well, the, this moment, because uh, your exam session right, starts in a week. So we know that you are also busy uh, with that. Um, so just a few words about uh, the uh, workshop. The topic of this edition is identity and how we represent it linguistically and uh, culturally through creative writing. Uh, creative writing, which um, becomes a sort of safe space as we uh, wanted to include also in the title of, of the workshop, a safe space from which it is possible to explore the, 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 the prism or the mosaic of individual and collective identity. So the uh, projects that we are going to uh, and the stories that we are going to listen to are about uh, identity, the several sides and flavors of, of identity. And uh, I'll just, uh, um, well, Licha, the floor is yours. So you can briefly introduce maybe what you've done and the, 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 then the, the, the students, the participants. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. I, I was just wondering, since there are a lot of um, parents and family members uh, from Italy, I was wondering if you could maybe say a few words in Italian. Sì, uh, scusate, <laughs> vero. Uh, dunque, um, tra i ringraziamenti ho voluto ringraziare Licia Canton per aver appunto uh, 
eh, condotto questo, questo workshop. Eh, il progetto è, è chiaramente sostenuto e, e finanziato dal Dipartimento di Studi Umanistici, fa parte dei nostri, delle nostre iniziative, dei nostri seminari professionalizzanti. Um, per me è stato un piacere, insomma, eh, avere sia Alicia come eh, appunto eh, workshop eh, leader, ma anche eh, essere stato in qualche modo il coordinatore insomma, di questo progetto. Uh, ho portato i saluti della coordinatrice eh, de del corso di studio in lingue e culture moderne e lingue e letterature moderne, la magistrale. Eh, voleva essere qui ma ha avuto un altro impegno istituzionale e, e purtroppo non, non le è stato possibile eh, partecipare. Um, ho voluto ringraziare il Dipartimento appunto per il sostegno che, che, che ha dato e anche per... Eh, voler includere no, questo tipo di attività all'interno di quelle che sono appunto la, la nostra offerta extracurricolare uh, che va oltre insomma i crediti che gli studenti devono conseguire per uh, appunto uh, la, la, conseguire il titolo poi uh, la, la laurea in lingue e culture moderne o lingue e letterature moderne. Ho ringraziato Ilan che è l'English Language Arts Network eh, un, uh, in Canada per aver organizzato dal punto di vista tecnico, no? per ospitarci uh, oggi e soprattutto ho voluto ringraziare gli studenti per aver preso parte a questo, a questo progetto, per aver anche in un momento appunto in cui stiamo andando verso la, la sessione d'esami, aver dedicato tempo ed energie uh, in, in, questo, in questo progetto. L'argomento, diciamo, il topic dell'edizione di quest'anno, questa è la seconda edizione che, che abbiamo eh, ospitato, eh, sempre con Licia Canton, due anni fa c'è stata la prima, quando eh, Licia Canton era writer in residence all'Università della Calabria, un periodo di un paio di settimane tra maggio e, e giugno. Questa è la seconda edizione e l'abbiamo voluta dedicare appunto all'identità, al tema dell'identità e quindi le storie, no? i racconti, i progetti che stiamo per sentire sono principalmente proprio una sorta di esplorazione no? di quello che è il tema dell'identità individuale, dell'identità collettiva, um, di un'identità che può essere anche geografica, dell'identità culturale in generale, che viene appunto declinata in 12 capitoli, potremmo dire, o brevi capitoli dai nostri, dai nostri studenti, che sono eh, tutti studenti e studentesse di, eh, della magistrale in lingue e letterature moderne e della triennale in lingue e culture moderne. Eh, tra le altre cose, poi veramente mi taccio perché altrimenti è troppo lungo, um, è stato non solo un modo per lavorare sulla scrittura, sulla scrittura creativa, quindi un ambito che solitamente non viene toccato dal, dai corsi eh, universitari in generale in Italia, cosa che invece no, creative writing è un... Sono degli insegnamenti eh, consolidati nel mondo anglosassone. Um, quindi non è stato solamente lavorare su queste competenze, su queste abilità, ma è stato anche sviluppare ulteriormente le competenze linguistiche degli studenti, perché eh, è stato fatto tutto in, in lingua inglese. E quello che appunto sentiremo oggi sono dei eh, racconti in lingua inglese. Quindi, um, come dire... Forse adesso non è il momento degli applausi, quelli li facciamo alla fine, ma eh, che l'applauso sia doppio, nel senso sia per eh, l'aspetto così eh, creativo, artistico sul, sul lavoro che hanno fatto, ma anche proprio una questione di um, eh, linguistica, quindi eh, un ulteriore no, sviluppo di quello che è poi eh, la, il loro percorso nell'acquisizione di competenze e conoscenze linguistiche. Quindi eh, le due cose, insomma, eh, chiaramente si rafforzano, quindi grazie anche per questo. Bene, Lice. Grazie, grazie. Eh, benvenuti. Good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to this special event. Thank you, Professor Casagranda, for this opportunity and your department for valuing this type of activity. Thanks to Elan and Nick Maturo for technical support. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am located on unceded indigenous lands. Jojage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. We acknowledge them and other nations who care for the land across our country, and we pay our respects to Canada's first storytellers. Before we get to the readings uh, that I'm sure everyone is very excited about, 
uh, I'd like to say how impressed I am by this group of 12 emerging writers and the text that they have produced in the workshop, Writing in a Safe Space. We've spent 20 hours together over the past seven weeks. It has been a pleasure to work with you, each and every one of you, to listen to you, to learn from you. Uh, I am inspired by your contribution and your participation during the workshop sessions. So it has, for me, as a workshop leader, it has been really a wonderful experience. And the stories, that you will hear today are all very different. Each emerging writer chose the topic and the genre, and uh, some of the readings that you'll hear today are excerpts of longer texts. Uh, I have given each um, reader five minutes, and therefore, if the text was much longer, they chose the appropriate five minutes to share with you today. Uh, allora, ogni um, scrittore in erba che è qui oggi uh, leggerà, presenterà per cinque minuti, anche se il testo magari è molto più lungo, hanno scelto i cinque minuti da presentarvi oggi. Sono molto molto felice di aver conosciuto queste eh, 12 persone, questi eh, 12 scrittori e scrittrici e seguirò con eh, molto interesse il loro sviluppo. Uh, we talked a lot about becoming a writer, so we are all in the process of becoming and um, everybody who participated in the workshop uh, did so for different reading for different reasons. This might be their first and only time writing a text and presenting it in public, and I hope it was a wonderful experience. Or this may be the first of many. So I will be following your work uh, from a distance after this workshop. And we begin now. Um, I'm really excited to introduce uh, Sabrina Zanfino, who uh, will be reading from her text. Sabrina, the microphone is yours. I will ask everybody to remain muted. Allora tutti con il microfono e il video spento while uh, someone is reading in the microphone. Sabrina, welcome. Hi, good afternoon. I'm reading a poem. Uh, it's called Arinda, which is the name of my small town. So, Arinda is your name, born to be the land of wars and fighters. Today you bloom among your rocks which speak about art and history. You shine, forgotten by your children who have gone. False, your story is mine and my story is yours, ours. I grew up listening to your singing at your antiquity at the voice of our community. Arinda, you mother, I feel you. Your waters flow in my blood. Your flag was mine. Your pain were my tears and your pride was my success. You, queen of this land, name in your honor. Walking in your streets and looking at your beauty is when I feel at home. It's in your arms in which I cradle my sleep. Your nights that hold my fears and your life give me life every day. I hear you cry because your young children are leaving, but you, my sweet Karinda, you don't know that we will always be your sons. You will always be our mother. Your identity is ours because you were and you are a maker, even if you don't know. It's in your enclosure where I cried, love and succeed. It's in your essence in which I found my roots, the love for my family, which I will always belong to. I feel you alive, Karinda, in me. You call my name while I walk through your deeper bowels, me, your daughters, and I feel you, my beloved. I see that you have may suffered so much, and behind these closed doors of your street, I imagine who you once were. Who were you? How many people tramped on your skin, I ask. I perceive your voice. You are telling me your memories. Who were behind all these doors? And I see them. I feel their voices and see their faces all those who I didn't meet in person. It seems so clear. Artisans they must have been because they shaped you so beautiful and glorious. 
Every building tell your history and every planted tree created a root. Our region is us. You, mother of tradition, land of wealth and resentment at the same time. Blessed with a castle, church which give you strength and love for your people and nature, which make you the main characters and news in our histories and hearts. However, I feel you sad now. I see you sad. Don't cry now, that is your commemoration. I touch your tears while the bells are ringing in celebration. But I comfort you. We will carry you with pride in our chest and our soul for the rest of our lives. Because wherever we go, we are your sons and you, our mother. It's in your silence, my beloved, in which I speak to myself. And thank you, Arinda, because you gave me the pureness in my grandmother's eyes, which I can't forget. And thinking of those that I also see your greatness, because I see you, woman, Calabrian, strong and generous like her. You and her, our bright land, where we all used to go to breathe better. It's in, in the touch of your wind that let me hear again the sweet sound of my grandfather accordion, which accompanied my childhood. It's in your garden where I see the small red flower that you used to brush my little face. The same flower I imagine you had in your castle arena when you were young. It's in your heat which hugged my body today, the same intensity I used to felt as a child. You, frame of my memories. You are in my cousins and our games, in my Sunday lunch and Christmas day, in the weak eyes of my father. It is in your eyes in your hair, in which I feel my beloved uncle who came back to you and nature you both are now. It's in your floor where I feel their steps behind mine. Thank you, Arinda, because you let me live in you. And I know I have changed a lot and sometimes I hated you to do the absence and failure of our frontier. But this is your essence, my essence, which I breathe in these sunny days before summer in which my memories live longer and deeply. This smell, your heat, your sun, all elements I belong. This is the smell of my skin and my family. Who am I? Where am I going? What will I be? My mother, I was always only born in you, from you and for you, and I cry like you. Sweet and sour is our fragrance, and I look at you from the highest parts of your body, Arinda, from your tower, and I see myself running on your ground, me, little and happy, where my mind will always be surrounded by love, joy, and love. A scene that we never change, my dear. You, my identity. But we know what makes you sad. Are we going to lose each other one day? Something made you rough and sharp, my sweet mother. I may leave you someday, but I will never forget you. And I promise I will tell you about your greatness to those who didn't have the opportunity to know your spirit, Sarinda. Your simplicity, your beauty, your strength, your imperfections. You whose arms are huge enough to embrace the entire world where all your sons live now. Be happy, because someday, you know, we will return in you, in the day of our death, when we will be together, sun, wind, rain, feast, trees, and sunshine, a time that no one can separate us, a mother, from her sons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Sabrina. It's, it's such a very beautiful text and so appropriate to begin with Sabrina's text. Um, beautiful prose and an ode, a prayer to the land that all 12 emerging writers are actually, you know, there right now. And I can say from, you know, being married to the, the son of Calabrian immigrants and knowing that a lot of my friends and colleagues who are here today, whether they be in Pavia or Montreal or Vancouver, there are many people who are outside of Calabria, but can really identify with Sabrina's text. So thank you very much, Sabrina. Mirko, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That was very uh, moving, I think, also because you connected, I mean, place, um, memory, um, bodies as well, and uh, family, uh, a mother, a father. Um, and maybe one thing for those who don't know that, Arinda is actually the old name of Rende, which is, well, the uh, place where the University of Calabria is. So it's, it's a, well, now it's a big town near uh, Cosenza, and that's where we are. And uh, yeah. Now we are online, but if we were 
uh, doing this in, in, let's say, in presence, we would be in, uh, in Aringa. So yeah, that was the perfect way to uh, open this, this, this meeting. So thank you. Thank you very much. I'm impressed. Thank you. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to invite Anastasia Parise uh, to read. Anastasia, the microphone is yours. And now I would like to remind when you are reading, you turn your camera on. All right. If you're not reading, your camera, your microphone is off. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to read the, just the first part, so only one point of view of the short story, Jenna and I. Here we go. You asked me to talk. No, you begged me to. I couldn't understand why you wanted me to meet you here, in this pub we hated a long time ago. The music was always too loud, the people were always too happy, and we hated it. We came every Saturday. I know, I remember. I remember how one night you wouldn't even look at me because you were so angry. We kept coming here, watching people, creating stories about them. How did they end up in this forgotten place? How did we end up here? We hated it. Yes, uh, one black beer and one soda, please. You still drink blacks, right? Oh, uh, I moved on to soda about a month ago. I'm pregnant, you know? It all seems so silly now, doesn't it? Thinking back at all the things we considered to be vital and we took so seriously. Of course not. For you, they still are vital. You've never moved on. Did I ruin your life? Don't worry, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Maybe after a couple of beers, it'll come up again. I don't think I got your question. What answers do you expect to get? I don't even know you. No, you're not still the same. No one remains who they were in high school. You always thought you were already there though. You were perfectly wrapped up for the real world. Do you still think that? The problem is I changed too much. I despised who I was, I'm sure you remember it. I'm in a good place now. The problem is you thought I was perfect. Why was that? Why did you try so hard to make me believe that? Who is even perfect? I'm in town because of my granny's illness. I came with my husband and my little girl, but she knew that. Why did you ask me here? Oh, why did I go away? Don't you know that? I don't really want to blame you. I guess we were just too young and maybe too different and maybe also trying so much not to feel so different. I guess we did love each other for some time. We just didn't know how to do it right. Yes, there is a right way. There are millions of right ways and millions of wrong ways. And maybe your way will be right for somebody. My way surely couldn't be. That's part of my changing. You have to change very much until you can realize how wrong you were. And I did. I'm not perfect now, but I can surely live, live with who I am. I couldn't before. Anyway, I'm still trying to get better. Why are you crying? You thought you would be different, seeing me here while seeing fireworks all around. Oh, you don't need fireworks. You still think you're in love with me, you see? That's the problem. You're really well in love, but just uh, with an idea of a person and you projected it onto me just as you could have done on anyone else. You chose me though, and that changed everything. I tried so much to live up to that idea. I was just a girl who thought she was in love and saw in her love the only thing that mattered. Until she didn't. But even then, you didn't let me leave you. It was always something, problems that I had to solve or sufferings into which you already were. So how could I add something to that? How could I be so cold hearted? Truth is, I was, because I kept lying to you. And that is something I'll never forgive myself for. I thought I was in love with you for one year. I pretended to be in love with you for three years more. It doesn't make sense, just stop it. I, I don't have to call my husband. I will just leave and you won't be seeing me again. How can you be so angry? 
I mean, I know I was wrong, but we broke up like nine years ago, I think. Yes, I'm talking about the last one, of course. Listen, you don't have the right to anything, okay? I don't have to tell you everything and I will keep for myself whatever I want to. Let me say that again. I don't want all the blame to fall on you, but on me neither. You knew how fragile I was and you knew that you could use that. Stop, just stop, please. Okay, that's enough. I'm leaving. I guess you can figure out why I left on your own. Thank you so much, Anastasia, for your beautiful text, for your wonderful performance. Um, and a lot of us can identify with your story you know, of, of lost love, moving on, revisiting our past decisions, and really a beautiful story about strength and moving on. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Yeah, and also I think about, you know, growing up and changing and how to do that. I mean, sometimes there is a right way or a wrong way or both. Um, sometimes it's also about pretending, as you were saying. So uh, that was very powerful, I think. Yeah, and I also appreciated the way you um, well, worked on dialogue because it's not that easy, especially when you perform. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Emma Milikio to the microphone. Emma. Me. It all quietly started on a day in March, the day someone knew my life wasn't supposed to stop. As a baby, I never knew what really happened on that Thursday just as someone didn't want me to breathe and live through it. Born alongside a sister, my twin to be exact, I fought and survived, already grown up. She and I were not the same, quite different, being honest, and yet that didn't touch us and we still love each other. It took a pretty long time for us to leave that white room, but as soon as that happened, our lives were in blue, matching cute little dresses and a style of our own. For our mother and father, the greatest gift in the world. Our differences meant we were not really a match, even though thoughts and feelings each of us could catch. We grew up together, yet not joined at the hip, and soon I am dependent, cost this toddler I would crawl while she walked and ran around, always holding my hand when I try and fall down. It was then that I'd smile and then go my merry way, without knowing that time would soon move again. And so it happened, from toddler to child I matured, reached a time of confusion, pain, tears, and gloom. Moments of sadness paired with delusion, the knowledge of not being like I wanted in my illusion. The day we were born, the doctor detected, when it comes to running marathons, she'll never be selected. To my family, it didn't matter. All they knew was, she's okay. And someday, with the right help, she'll be a champion in the fray. As young as I was, I trusted that judgment, but as time went on, my pain became grander. Moments of play got short with an ice back when kids didn't like me and acted with spite. I would then cry and walk away from the wrong, toxic words, wipe my tears and keep trying to be strong on my own. As a child, being disabled was not easy at all, and I felt lucky of someone to lean and rely on. As of right now, I am an adult. It's been years since those burdens. I feel glad to have stuck around, not letting pain be my hurdle. I'm so clumsy, so awkward, so prone to falling and hurting. But it's now that I'm calmer because time kept me learning. Back then, I didn't feel right. But now that I'm better, I know I'm not wrong and I deserve to be respected. Deserve love, deserve friends, deserve every good thing that happens. Because once the lights go down, I'll still have people who stand there. Full of the person I am, for no one's story to play with. I'm just me. My name's Emma, and others need to accept it. Thank you, Emma. Thank you for that very uh, strong performance. Um, and I know that it's a, a very difficult text to write and also to share publicly, and I want to congratulate you for that it's very very strong thank you yeah i agree also thank you. um thank you. the way you chose each word right there were like 
stones, but not because they were like hitting something or somewhere, but because they were like standing out as, as uh, I don't know, dark pebbles on, on a white beach, sort of. So uh, the, the power of the words that you selected and the, the rhythm and that you gave to, to what you said and, well, the text, so the, 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 the rhyme and the rhyming. So that, that, that was impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, now it's my pleasure to invite Isabella to the microphone. Hi, everybody. Okay. Um, it is a truth, universally knowledge that, wait, this is another story. The story that I'm going to tell you is about a man whose, whose life has been pretty basic. And do you want to know why? Of course you don't. But this is a story and I'm going to tell it anyway. Let me introduce you to two characters which will be fundamental to this tale. They are Mr. Skelton, Skeleton, and his ghost. Their names are Boney and Casper. I know that seems insane, but please, please trust the process. So let's start from the beginning. Mr. Skelton has always been a special kid, not because he was hyperactive or because he was bad at school, but because he always had a pessimistic point of view, a truthful, he would say. The reason for that is still unknown. Well, it's sure that his parents had a huge impact on him when he was a child because they were both therapists, but it's enough. Eric has always been interested in the local country. Therefore, he agreed with Berkman, the author of the book, The Antidote, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking. This book is very important because it allows us to take a look at Eric's way of thinking. So, According to Berkman, the excessive pursuit of happiness does nothing but makes us depressed. In other words, are our uninterrupted attempts to eliminate all that is negative. And this is just a negative way to happiness that translates into learning to appreciate uncertainty and to stop trying to think positively than it costs and to familiarize oneself with failure and even to value death. Despite this, he wanted to love, be loved, and consequently be happy. One day, while walking to school, he saw a girl with a showy backpack climbing on a tree. She's going to fall, he thought. But surprisingly, she appeared to land quietly as if nothing had happened, unaware of the danger she was facing. The girl's name is Alice, and no, she wasn't Eric's first love, but her friend was. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? Anyways, the thing that hit him the most was the fact that this girl ignored him. So the more she pushed him, the more she fell in love. This part of Eric's life is told by Boney, which represents carnal feelings. Love, stated by Boney, is something which hurts your earth literally if don't can respond it. But what Eric hadn't foreseen were the insane things that he could have done in the name of love. Number one, nothing. <laughs> you hear me? He did nothing to win or hurt. It's an ordinary story, remember? The most exciting thing that Eric could have done in the name of love is giving some flowers to a classmate for a birthday. The thrilling part of Eric Skelton's life is then told by Casper, which represents the abstract instead. Casper is wiser than Boney, which, although focuses a lot on the feelings of the protagonist, she lacks empathy. The skeleton, therefore, is very interested in what's going on in Eric's head. He basically wants to know why he's such a simple man. And guess what? I think we'll never know. Thank you very much, Isabella. Um, thank you very thank much. You. I really appreciate your your story. Very serious, also funny, and your wonderful way of, of performing it. Um, thank you. Thanks for uh, sharing this thought provoking text. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And also thank you for the irony, I would say, right? And uh, especially at the beginning with the intertextual reference, yeah. um, which was a very smart uh, way to yeah, um, start to, so a very good um, way to, to, yeah, to also start your, your performance. So good. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella. And now it's just one, question. just one thing, yes. Licia. Sorry. Yes. Uh, maybe we should say that, uh, and I will say that in Italian as well. That if you ah. if you have questions uh, at the end of the, the 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 presentations, there will be time for for questions or comments or whatever. Quindi alla fine delle delle presentazioni ci sarà del tempo per delle domande che eh, possiamo eh, fare condividere. Um, potete anche utilizzare la, la, la chat se, se, se volete.
volete già farne qualcuna, comunque diciamo le domande um, le lasciamo alla fine. Grazie. Yeah, great idea. Questions at the end. Ok. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to invite Mariana Lanzilotta to the microphone. Mariana. Hi everyone. <laughs> I'm gonna read an extract from my story I titled Memory from Outer Space. So here it is. What did the alien look like? Patrick seems genuinely concerned. Nothing definite that I can describe perfectly. It reminded me of one of those doggo figures we saw once in TV. Its eyes and mouth were hollow, and it felt like a but it felt like a human. My voice is shaking. I feel as ridiculous as when I ran away from the dog back then. Shame is something that can stay within us for the longest time. I never told these things to Patrick. I never told anyone. Patrick's parents knew that something bad had happened to me during that year, and they naturally explained it to their son. I always felt as if there was a mutual understanding of the situation. I thought you were weird because you got scared of that dog, that's all. I am sorry for never asking you what actually happened. But back then, everyone knew you as the girl who threw herself in the river. I knew you as my friend, so I, I felt no need in getting more information about it. Talking about it and explaining my emotion feels wrong and embarrassing as if the situation and the feeling that it caused in me should not be related. My mom called me a fool for being scared all the time, but I was so frightened and overwhelmed by the outside world. A mother's words mark your conscience, and then you're 23 and you start your best friend and it feels like a blank figure. If I could take the moment, the moment I met that creature and put it on film and give it to you, I would. Patrick is now looking at me with sympathy. I will give it to you only so you can leave the same experience from my point of view and words wouldn't be needed and I wouldn't feel lonely. Since I looked that thing in the eyes and I stared at its hollow inside, it feels like my conscience got lost in it. As if when the creature took off or returned to its lonely faraway planet, the awareness of my surroundings left too. I live on this earth as a shell without memory nor perception. Reality feels like a seamless dream, and just as a dream, it looks sketchy. Words seem vague as, well, vague as well. Describing all of this is nearly impossible. Me and Patrick ceased to be children over 10 years ago, yet I can help but still feel like one on stressful occasions or when I'm particularly bitter. I live as a child resembling an adult, seeking for closure for all that happened because what took place back then cannot be reduced to an hallucination. The heft of guilt and shame has become so persistent through these years that my brain decided to withdraw itself from existence. A straight line floating in the sky appears above our heads. It would be logical to think that an airplane is passing by, but it's them, extraterrestrial creatures looking down on an hostile world. Please don't annihilate and I liked us. We know we're bad, but we can also be pretty fun down here. One day we will all be nothing anyway, and our memories will be yours. But for now, please let us make more memories. As Patrick screams these words to the sky, I look at him and I recognize that we never stopped playing in a make-believe fantasy. Thank you very much, Mariana. It would have been wonderful to have listened to the whole story. This is just an excerpt. Thank you very much for sharing. It's a very, very good reading and a very touching and powerful story. Um, and I look forward to seeing it published some more, somewhere in the future, the entire story. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, I also like the idea um, I guess that, um, well, it's, it's in what you read, but also probably in, in the whole story is that uh, to be ourselves, we, we need someone else. So uh, it takes somebody else, even someone, someone from outer space to find who we, who we are and to be who we, who we are. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Simone Librandi to the microphone. Simone? Hi, everyone. It was enough for me 
only to look at the way the school bodies and the teachers spoke or moved. Then I would imitate them flawlessly. I once even dropped a conversation between a woman and her friend. A friend of hers and her husband had bought a canary for their child's birthday. It was small and yellow, like a feather slice of lemon. And since they both had to work, they called a neighbor to babysit their kid. When they got back home, the woman's legs were shaking as if they had no bones inside. The poor babysitter had been cut in half by their coffee table. The canary was picking some seeds out of her hand and they never found their child. Eventually, the two women burst out laughing. I got goosebumps and that night when I was ready to go to bed, I started chirping. My grandmother used to tell me, if people around you don't celebrate your achievements, they're not good for you. And I think she was right. People I used to live with didn't think mine was a valid quality, a valid talent. They were quite upset and envious about the fact that I could become their speculative version their hidden twin, their doppelganger. And when I specialized in imitative arts, they saw it as an insult. Do I have a name? And if I do, what is it? Have I ever had a name? How do my friends call me? Do I have friends? And if I do, who are they? Have I ever had friends? Have I ever had a partner? Somebody to kiss and trust? Somebody to be weak and afraid with? To be human with? Thank you very, very much, Simone, for that wonderful performance, beautiful delivery uh the tone is perfect and uh the message is very powerful um you know as i said uh, the other day it's eerie it's perfect and uh, of course this is just an excerpt of the whole text and again i would love to see you perform the whole text at another venue thank you simone Thanks. yeah thank you Thank you very much. It was also very, I don't know, intimate, I guess, or, or you, you gave that, that, that feeling of uh, intimacy. And I really liked also um, um, using and repeating the concept of names and naming uh, also in relation to our identity. Uh, of course, naming is part. It's the most important part, I guess, of, of what we are. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, next, I would like to call uh, Rosa Londino to the microphone. Rosa. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm going to read the story of a girl, and the title is From Surviving to Living. This is the story of Lila. Lila is a girl just like many other girls. She is 22 as she just graduated. Among the things she loves were books, in particular female protagonist novels, cats, and eating pizza Saturday night with her best friends. Readers, at this point you will think something like, she seems normal, she seems to have such a linear life, what's the matter? Why should we read about her? When you are just, when you are just a 22 years old girl, people think that everything is good in your life. You have everything under control, your issues couldn't be so bad. But they're wrong. You can be just a young girl and have to deal with some trauma. You can be just a young girl and have a problem with your sexuality or your physical appearance. As I say, dear reader, Laila is just 22. That's how the story began, a story of numbness. Being an introvert during your childhood years can be such a blessing for your parents. She looks so calm and lovely. How lucky you both are. This is what other parents would often say. 
the reader don't trust this kind of girl I'm talking about the kid who loves staying in silence and staring alone. Reading, stand up playing. This kid obviously hides something, but it's not her fault. Baby Layla had to grow up living side by side with her fears. Sometimes these fears were normal ones. Over times, they were completely irrational. This is how it went. Therefore, she discovered the pleasure of studying and listening to, Lan to Nand by Linkin Park a Lithium by Nirvana. In music and reading, she always found a way of comforting herself. We all know, dear reader, but knowing that someone feels your same thrills can be a form of solace, another way of not feeling alone. It's 2020 and there's a pandemic, Mina is in the world. Lila used to study for a second degree in another city, far enough from a little village, but the pandemic ruined all her plans. She loved her family, but she always thought that by the time you become an adult, you need to detach yourself from the familiar environment. You have to tempt yourself, your abilities, to see how strong and capable you are. As a matter of fact, she's leaving her 20s during a pandemic, and she was first to come back to her parents' house. What she doesn't know is that these things are coming in her life. In fact, not only her, but thousands of students were first to take the same decision that year. Among the students, there was her sole neighbor, such a mosey bow she knew nothing about until that moment. Coming back to her parents' home was like coming back to her old self, her little self, the kid and teenager she was. Laila was escaping from all her life, or we could better say, escaping from her own life experience. She had to face this environment again and its toxicity too. But Laila is strong, she finds new techniques to adjust herself, studying and distracting. From her window, she could see a boy always playing his piano. He was Archie. He was studying to become a musician. She couldn't hear the sound of his playing, but she could see him. All his expression, his face transmitted all his only good vibrations. His passion was moving, touching. At the beginning, they all exchanged some looks, but with time, they got closer. Long walks, waiting for sunsets together, and deep conversation changed their behavior. Laila finally found a place and a person with whom she could feel comfortable and safe. All she had to do was looking through her window. No matter how dark it got, Laila always finds her way reading, listening, walking, existing, loving. Thank you very much, Rosa. I love your story. Uh, it's very current and it's a reminder of what a lot of us and especially young people and students have gone through over this last, you know, 18 months. And certainly I remember myself at that age and I can really identify with Lila. So thank you very much for sharing your story. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I, I, I liked uh, um, well, this idea of moving from surviving to leaving also by finding someone we, are, we can feel comfort, comfortable and safe with, uh, especially yeah, these days or over the last uh, months, as, as you were saying before. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so um, our next guest is Francesca Principe. Francesca, the microphone is yours. Good evening. My short story is called The Monster in My Room. Going to bed. Why did her stomach feel like a battlefield? What was wrong with her? What was keeping her awake? She had felt like this for years and she thought it was normal, but not today. It's life, it is what it is. No, it can be. She was going to bed after being careless and distracted for the entire day, but now even bedtime was no longer a safe place. Something was keeping her awake for many nights, the feeling of a presence, an awkward presence. The night was not going to be different, but in her mind, something was changing. She started to think that this feeling was not bearable anymore, 
but above all, that what she was feeling was not normal. She was ready to see and fight what was disturbing her. It was midnight when the master came in. He put his best pajamas on and got into her bed. Now she was seeing him. He was not invisible anymore. She was not afraid. Even if she had refused to see him during all these years, she knew deep inside that he had always been there. But now she had to confront him and speak to him. She looked at his giant black eyes and at his fluffy purple fur. She opened her mouth and finally let him speak. Who are you? His mouth stayed closed for a few seconds. It did not expect this kind of question, but then he answered, I am a part of you. I have to be here. Next to you. She was confused. The fluffy monster was not steady at all, but it was bulky and unwanted. You're taking all the space in my bed. Get out of here. I don't want you here. She tried to throw him out of bed, but he clenched to the flowery sheets and managed to come back and make room for himself. It was not a big monster. It was just as big as her pillow, but just as annoying as the noise of a drill on a Sunday morning. You cannot throw me away like this. I am a part of you. It started to get bigger. Now they were both out of bed. A conversation. She understood that it was not the right way to treat him. It was better to ask him more questions. It was funny to see these two, these two creatures on the floor with questionable pajamas talking about their identity. She really understood that it was part of her. The purple monster was her, was her worst enemy. The thing she had ignored for years, it wasn't normal and it wasn't life. This fluffy monster was her anxiety. During this weird night, she discovered that he had started being part of her since she was 13. Like all teenagers, she was confused about her identity. No one had explained to her what was going on, why she was feeling sad and angry all of a sudden, or why she couldn't recognize her body anymore. The anxiety invisible monster told her that it began to grow bigger when she was 18. Her life was changing so much. She was about to start university. Her death thoughts had never disappeared. But above all, she had never had an official boyfriend up to that time. This status didn't bother her. She wanted to be free. She didn't like to be attached to someone just because everyone around her was in a relationship. But the weight of the position made her feel anxious. The little monster described that moment as the most tiring ever. But the worst was yet to come. The purple creature spoke about when she was 20. During those years, she was in love with a guy that made her feel miserable for most of the time. It was the kind of toxic relationship where one of the two people is okay and the other suffers every minute. It was in that moment that, that everything made her feel anxious. She didn't know what she was experiencing. It was like living in an alternative world where existing with this monster by her side was something normal. She thought that this emotion was created by love. The purple thing could not believe that. How could she have seen him? He tried so hard to get noticed, even in the simple actions of everyday life, like eating or attending a class. He was there. Waking up. While the master continued to tell his deeds, she understood that every part of her was influenced by his presence. She had not forgotten what had happened during those years, but it was like she had erased the sufferings, the bad feelings, and the pain in her stomach. She didn't want to see, nor to admit, or talk about it. But now something had changed. The monster was there next to her, speaking with her, clearing up her mind. So, now I see you. What does it mean? The monster was sad and confused. I don't know, maybe I have to go, but I don't want to. In former times, she would have probably allowed him to stay, but now she had discovered the strength, the awareness, and the will. She could see them too, standing behind the anxiety, making room in front of him, making him disappear. The purple monster could no longer resist. It vanished from her side, leaving as a reminder of purple hair that she took and put on the nightstand. It was 2 a.m. when she fell asleep, the best night sleeping years. When she woke up, everything that had, that had, that had happened that night echoed in her mind like a confused, strange dream, deathly strange. She took the water bottle in the nightstand to take a sip. Either was the purple hair. It wasn't a dream. She felt free.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Francesca, for a very powerful and original way of presenting a very serious health issue, for naming it and for, for dealing with it. This is a, a, a wonderful example of writing as part of the healing process. And I congratulate you for that. It's a story of strength uh, about anxiety, about toxic relationships. Uh, so many of us young and less young can identify with your story. So uh, congratulations and thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. I agree. I mean, the monster is not just in, in our room, but it's in, in, inside of us. Um, yeah, uh, that was a wonderful way to uh, share and well describe uh, an experience we can all relate to. Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Up next, Fabiana Badolato. Uh, Fabiana, the microphone yeah. is yours. Thank you. Um, the title of my short story is The Bookseller. Call me when. At all men this suggestion, perhaps this is the lightest way to introduce yourself or introduce yourself to someone. There are probably many, but since I read it on the first page of Moby Dick, I found it extremely original. I had to sell off that copy for little money as it was very shabby, but I would have preferred to keep it with me at my nightstand. Perhaps this is the only disadvantage of working in a bookstore. If you like books so much, you certainly won't like selling them as much. It is the ironic reality of any bookseller, I think, to give away one of your closest friends in exchange for the loss. When I started reading Dracula, I was traveling somewhere with my family. I had just started university a few years back and I was still in contact with a high school crush of mine. Of course, he didn't know who he was, he never did. What I remember is that during that trip, I started having a chat with him, but it didn't turn out well. I began to realize how insignificant it was to him, how little I mattered. Between the pages of Dracula lies all the disappointments of my youthful love. And thus, Bram Stoker's death is not the story of a great friendship, it is not the chronicle of a cruel and sadistic vampire, at least not to me. That black and red cover, as much as I loved it, as much as I was passionate about its content, still pierces me every time I look at it. Here resides the reader's disability to modernize both literary and personal emotions. It is a debilitating process. It stains, contaminates the reading. And that is how I see this book, contaminated by my own past. I still remember that girl I sold it to. She arrived at the shop all wet as it was pouring rain outside. She needed a copy of Dracula for an English literature class. I remember the sense of shame I felt when I handed it to her. I had the feeling that in there I had also left all my rumoured bitterness and that she, by reading the book, could have spied on me. It was as if in that book there was not only such a story, but mine as well. Sometimes I wonder how it came to my mind to try my hand at this business selling books without wanting to sell a single one. I thought my love of books would make me perfect for this job, which would fit perfectly. But maybe the truth is that to do a job well, you don't have to like it. You don't have to be romantically involved. Never mix what with private life wasn't it. When I bought the shop with an inheritance left to me by my grandfather, my mother seriously began to make me doubt about of its position. It's too hidden, Gwen, she always told me. Make some of its advertisement to your shop here in the town so that people will notice it, or the business will fall apart. I remember as a child I loved going on a, to a bookstore called The Island. The sign on the store featured an open book on which houses and people were laid out. 
the book itself was a sort of uh, inhabited island. I really liked that sign and I once told my grandfather that when I grew up, I wanted to live there on the island. But when I received that inheritance as an adult, I interpreted it as a sign. He, who was the only one who knew that little tiny secret of mine and I, who never forgot me. As he looked around the empty and desert shore, a Britannia abandoned by its Roman Empire, I noticed a small book out of place. It was a collection of early 20th century poems. I had asked my sister to take care of the poetry and theatre section, but evidently she didn't do it with extreme diligence. I opened it absently and came across Yeats' poem, The Second Coming. Things fall apart, the center cannot fall. This was what was happening. Things were falling apart and the center that was me couldn't fall. I will always remain that center. I will always be an island bird, but I will never be conquered. I took the shop keys, took off my four-leaf clover chain as a sign of complete divorce from that place which no longer belonged to me. I looked back again and then opened the exit door. A cool breeze and a wave of sunshine washed over me. New islands awaited me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabiana. There's so much to unravel here. Uh, but let me just say it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful story and a beautiful reading. And for those of us who, who love all the things that, that you've included in your, in your story, not just books and literature, uh, but also uh, heritage and possibilities, um, I hope you're, you'll find a home for that story so that other people can also benefit from reading it. Thank you very much for sharing it today. Thank you. Yeah, and also thank you for um, giving us this idea of uh, the island book, right? New islands that we um, may discover. And I, I really liked um, the idea of life through literature, all the intertextual uh, references. And uh, yeah, how especially our lives as students and teachers and academics and people being involved with literature at several levels so how our life resonates with the books that we that we read and it's part of us so yeah thank you thank you all right uh next i would like to invite federica cairo to the microphone federica good evening um, the title of my short story is <clears throat> Proche en Arrêt. She rolled down the car window. A drop of water fell from her hair, still wet, and left a darker trace on her blue shirt. A shiver. In Geneva, it was cold again during the last days of September. She had hurried to cook dinner and had run out of time to dry her hair before leaving. She caught a glimpse of the taxi driver through the rear view mirror. She arranged a sentence in her mind and tried to meet his eyes. Excusez-moi, um, pourrez-vous aller un peu plus vite, s'il vous plaît? She stumbled over the first bit of the sentence. D'où venez-vous, Italie? He asked. She nodded and smiled. She already knew she sounded Italian. Only two years had passed since she had first arrived from Calabria, and she couldn't say a word in French at that time. She rummaged in her purse and looked at the time on her phone. Their flight would end in 10 minutes. A note of tension in the stomach. Her family would spend one week at their house. She clenched their fists to stop her pulse from racing. Seven days. They were not enough. This trip was a present by her father to her mother for their 30th wedding anniversary, and she had a whole program for their stay. In her mind, she revised the itinerary that she had planned and looked back as if to assure herself that their first destination was still there. The globe, a wooden sun standing out against the Swiss sky. The driver sensed her apprehension. Est-ce que vous travaillez au CERN? She spun around and leaned over the front seat. 
Yes, she thought. I'm a doctor, a student in particle physics. But she suddenly realized that perhaps he was not looking for a complete and detailed reply. While leaning back, she opted for a sterile we. Oui. She was used to hearing that same question in Italian every time she came to her hometown. Same question, same answer. A bare but satisfying C. Si. An admission of guilt. Usually, the inquirers neither knew nor cared about her deeper reasons and complex explanation. They knew what was important to them. She had left the nest too soon in order to live alone in a foreign country and to climb the ladder. She looked to her right. Airport International de Genève, her stop. She handed some money to the taxi driver. Another drop of water fell and left darker red stamp on the 20 franc note. She walked through the door and rushed to get to the arrival board. She skimmed over the names of the cities. La Mezia, landed. Hundreds of suitcases were being loud around, and the noise like a buzzing of bees hit her ears. She reached the arrival area and stood on tiptoe, balancing her weight while holding a white board with red writing on it. Benvenuti. She had prepared it to welcome her family. Obviously, her father, mother and sister didn't need any sign to recognize her, but she wanted to act the part of their chauffeur. She peered into the distance, trying to spot their faces and to blur the swarm of people surrounding her. A young girl was pointing out the baggage claim area to the parents. It was her sister. She grabbed and held her tightly, and at once she headed all the laws of physics that she had been venerating and studying and learning by art for years. Why can time stop? She wanted to observe her sister into her skin to steal from her hair all the good smells of home. A drop of water and salt fell on the whiteboard with the red writing leaving a mark of pure joy. Thank you so much, Federica. Uh, it's such a beautiful, powerful, timely text. Uh, you did a great reading. Um, I love the use of uh, the device of the stone using French and Italian in your text. Um, it's also very current, you know, the, the, the decision to leave your home country to pursue opportunities, you know, la fuga dei cervelli. And uh, of course, as someone who, who left Italy very young uh, and whose parents left all of their family, I can really feel the emotion in your story, you know, making choices that cause you to live away from your home land but also away from the people who love you and uh, thank you so much for sharing and for such a beautiful and emotional text yeah yeah i i i appreciated the use the way you employed languages right to um express the feeling of being displaced not only geographically but also linguistically and um culturally so uh, a displacement of, uh, well, someone's identity as well uh, is, goes through uh, several levels, right? Languages, cultures, places. So yeah, thanks. All right, I believe we have two more writers to invite to the microphone and the next person uh, I'd like to invite Jessica Salerno to the microphone. Jessica. Hello. So the title of my text is Lighthearted Needed. If anyone would have told me that in less than a year, things would have been as they are today, I probably would have soundly laughed, said Meg on the other side of the phone. Her laugh is probably what people mostly remember of her. She had never been so serious and laughing was what she loved to do the most in life. That's also why Claire was so grateful for their friendship. Although they were nearly 30 years old, they were still behaving as teenagers, so excited to have a ride among the city's lights and to drink with friends on the weekends so friendly to meet new people every day and so adventurous to discover the world. 
they were just so happy of their lightheartedness until that moment. It can never, uh, I can't never remember the last time I was laughing to the point of crying, Meg went on, recalling enjoyable moments of the past. Why isn't it possible anymore? Because things have changed, Meg, replied Claire, exhausted of repeating the same words hundreds of times in each phone call. Claire and Meg were best friends and were used to hearing each other several times in a day. But in the last four months, their phone calls became longer than ever. They lasted no less than 50 minutes each. What was different in these phone calls was their voice each time sadder and disappointed, sometimes nearly exasperated as a consequence of the bad time they were living in. At that time, it became harder than ever to not feel frustrated or scared by COVID-19. Meg was overwhelmed day by day by such negative feelings, and for Claire it was like watching a flower slowly wither. The, mo the worst thing for her was being affected by such growing negativity and feeling it as a heavy rock on her back, becoming heavier and heavier over time. Such heaviness slowly affected everyone in town, no more smiles on people's faces, only fear and terror. The pandemic was like a big dark cloud that was covering the earth and leading everything to death. Do you still remember our trips together, Claire? asked Meg while she was lying on the couch, watching a little black spot on the wall. Her imagination slowly changed the spot in the starting point of an imaginary trip, painted on a map from which a little airplane went on flying around. Of course, replied Claire, excited by her memories. In a few seconds, she went back in the past. Uh, do you think we will be able to catch an airplane again one day? Asked Meg, still watching her imaginary airplane flying from one side to the other of the wall, probably still not sure about its final destination. I hope so. We still have thousands of, pla of places to visit, said Claire, standing up from the bed and reaching her desk. She started reading her wish list. London, Paris, Berlin, Amsterdam, and Rome were already delayed, as well as Tokyo, Shanghai, and other cities, memories of their overseas tours. But there were still plenty of places waiting for them to visit. I won't be able to travel again. I'm so scared of the world, said Meg, after watching the airplane being destroyed by an explosion. How could it be, Meg? I was the one scared of airplanes, not you. Things have changed, Claire. That was the perfect occasion to use her friend's words. Yes, but it doesn't mean that you will stay at home forever. Why not? Are you serious? Repl replied Claire, becoming angrier. I can never imagine to stay 10 minutes on a bus. How could I imagine a trip on the other side of the world? You just need time but everything will go back to normality. How could you say that? Meg's voice was more bitter than ever. I don't know, but it won't last forever, Meg. I hope so. Listen to me. Fear is a temporary feeling. Regrets are forever. Meg didn't answer. The airplane disappeared. The black spot changed again its shape. Now into Claire's words, floating in front of her. I'm sure you don't want to live a life full of regrets just because you are scared of what is outside. You already know what's out there. You know the beauty of the world and how much fun is to exploring it. We can do it together again. Meg wasn't sure about what to say. Uh, that's because she didn't answer for a while. Then discouraged said, I just would like to live again moments of true joy and lightheartedness. I know, Meg, I know. Thank you very much, Jessica. That was beautifully read. Um, a very current, very pertinent text, a beautiful use of, of dialogue between Claire and Meg. 
uh, a wonderful depiction of our current reality, uh, as well as our vulnerabilities and uh, uncertainties. You did a really good job of, of presenting that. Um, so thank you very much for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. And I also like the, the way you combined memory and uh, uh, well, imagination and technology and uh, uh, something that belongs to looking back the past and the future anticipating the future so this sort of back and forth that, that was interesting thanks thank you all right and now it's my pleasure to invite lorenzo costabile to the microphone yes i'm here you hear me yes i would like to see faces also congratulate with my colleagues because they're so good, aren't they? Like writing poetry, narrative, I wouldn't be capable of doing that. So yeah, in fact, I wrote totally different things. So anyway, I'm gonna read it. Uh, I attended to a workshop once, really nice place to share ideas, meeting interesting people, find out more about yourself. Initially, the host tried to get to know us better. She asked us about our lies. So it was nice being asked questions. You know, we felt important. These days, nobody seems to care about the others. They just show off. I don't care about you watching my stories from the darkness of your room. I'm happy and I want you to see that, you know. So questions like, what are you passionate about? What's your biggest fear? What's my biggest fear? And my mind started to wonder. So does the fear of darkness, the fear of deep sea, of losing friends, relatives, of finding burglars in your kitchen eating your favorite biscuits when you come home from work, you know, these kinds of things. For me, it's things I cannot control. You know, it just makes me super anxious thinking about destructive events, natural forces, everything that had absolutely any possibility to change or avoid. You're probably thinking, well, friend, you might be just scared of death. Well, who isn't? After all, everything we do is just a distraction from this constant, terrible, dreadful, miserable idea that we are dust and we're going to die one day. No, uh, I have something more specific than that. Earthquakes. You know what I fear the most? Thinking about myself taking a shower when an earthquake strikes, probably singing, probably Dua Lipa. So uh, I would not regret dying singing Dua Lipa. What do you harmonize Vivaldi's Four Seasons under the shower? Beethoven, like an 18th century man making a shampoo? Come on, give me a break. I don't laugh. I know you're laughing, you might be laughing. I hope so, I don't see you, but this is serious. This could happen any moment. So seriously, picture this. I'm in my shower singing, I don't know, break my heart, yeah. Everything starts moving, shaking. I look around, there's no bathroom. It's on the balcony, perfect, typical situation. Would be a big problem generally, but now there's an earthquake. I feel time is expiring and I have to grab it there, but that will take me at least 20 seconds and I don't have them. I could go in my room, but choosing a, a nice outfit would take me more than 20 seconds. So I figure I will either die wearing an amazing outfit or I will maybe survive running naked down the street. I choose the second option. So going down the stairs, I think, well, you know, it could be worse. This last year of pandemic has been a disaster for everyone but at least I had time to work out every single day. Now I'm in my best shape ever. So if there's a right moment to show up nude to the world, I think it's this one. So I get down, I'm out there completely naked in the middle of the street in my small town, Calabria, Southern Italy. You know, these types of places usually see old people sitting on the sides of their own observing and judging everyone and everything that passes by. These guys look at you disappointed, even if you're wearing ripped jeans and I'm naked. So, but I'm kind of confident, you know, I'm proud. I'm, I'm kind of proud, you know, of my, of my work, of my, of my workouts. And at this point, I somehow want people to stare at me, you know, just stare at me. But 
But then I see my neighbor, my neighbor, Gianfranco. This man is intolerable. He's one of those people who just don't ever shut up. He always judges. It's even worse than those old people. At least they judge you in silence. So Gianfranco always feels this need to be honest with you, sincere, but it's not sincerity, it's just unpoliteness, you know. And he sees you like getting in your car in the morning, going to work in a hurry, and he stops you just to say that he doesn't like your new haircut. I think it makes your head smaller, he says, or something like that. So it just doesn't know good manners. I was going to a date once, just in a suit, and he asked me if I was going to a funeral. So it's so annoying, I swear. So now that you know him, I'm out there naked, completely naked, proud, you know. And I see him, and he sees me, and he comes to me, and he asks me, have you put on some weight? And at that moment, the voice of the host woke me up. So, Lorenzo, what's, what's your biggest fear? And I say, oh, I guess meeting my neighbor, Gianfranco. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. That was hilarious. Okay, yeah. I, 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 have, I had read it and I had heard it and I'm still laughing. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. It's a nice way to end our event today. Uh, you have very powerful writing. I'd like to see you on a stage, you know, Oops. in a, a, someday I'm going to be in the audience and uh, maybe even see you on TV. Make people laugh. We need to laugh. Thank you. Uh, very yes, much absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> that was, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Bravo. Um, and it's sort of going back to where we started because earthquakes and Calabria, it's very, uh, yeah, let's say, it's real, it's real. Here it's real. It's here. real. But one thing about Dua Lipa, sing levitating, because then you have the option. You can levitate and fly and grab. Yeah, I, I thought about that, right? <laughs> Good. No, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Um, oh, that was great. Uh, that was great. Thank you. Thank you to all 12 um, of you for sharing. I think, I mean, the audience is still there and everybody has commitments, right? Those of us, those who are here from Canada, they're, they're actually tuning in during their lunch break and they're still here. So uh, I wanna thank all of you for sharing your writing and I hope that you keep writing and I hope that you fi keep finding venues to share your writing to the public um it's been a, a beautiful beautiful experience um it's 128 mirko what do we Maybe, do I, well what about questions from okay so the audience? let's Let's or let's, maybe i don't know um, okay questions so from the students to other students but i don't think they they i mean you shared this for 20 hours so you you, you already <laughs> know everything you want to know but so, anyway, if you if there are questions, sorry. Yeah. yeah so usually that's it. That this is the the final experience where you get to read your text to a public, and then you we usually have a question period. So let's take a few minutes and see if the audience has questions. And uh, students, don't worry. Uh, you know, if we don't have time to go back and celebrate, we will celebrate at another time. Because I had planned a celebration, like to go okay, back. Okay, so all right. Yeah, so, so let's you... take like five, ten minutes if, if five, there are, minutes. If there are yeah. questions. So everybody out there, you can um, turn on your videos. Se avete delle domande, let's not forget. There's some people here who don't understand yeah. English, right? So se avete delle domande, il momento di porle. Uh, ringraziamo tutti voi che siete venuti ad ascoltarci. Um, so we're, we're taking questions. You can write them in the chat. You can, uh, if you feel comfortable, unmute and ask your question. If it's directed, it's for somebody specific, mention their name. If it's, if gen, we'll take general comments, congratulations as well. <laughs> Silence. Silencio. No questions. That's okay. That's okay. I'm sure people have questions and they're gonna they're gonna write to me after with the questions. Always happen. Sorry, I, I just wanted to first of all congratulate on all 
these brilliant students. I'm really so proud of you. You, you are so gifted and talented. And I enjoyed uh, every one of your stories. And I think you, you should really pursue your talent. And I wish to thank you, Licha, because she obviously inspired you in the right way. So um, thank you all and congratulations. And I really hope you, you go on writing like this because it's brilliant. And it's brilliant to get to know you better because sometimes, yeah. you know, you, you, meet, you meet your students in classes and, and teaching uh, online is not the same thing because you don't really see them, unfortunately. Uh, uh, they, they, they have to uh, uh, shut down the video and I can only talk to uh, the screen of my computer and I know that they're, they're listening to me but I don't get to see them but I really felt today that I had the opportunity to get to know them and, and in a very intimate way I mean it was um, a wonderful experience for, for me so thank you very much and congratulations <laughs> So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. That was Pro uh, Professoressa Renata Oggero. Yes, of course, you know, in a workshop setting with 12 students, you really get to know the students. And uh, I'm very grateful that they were so forthcoming um, with their thoughts, opinions and, and words and creativity as well. So thank you for that comment. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a comment from Valentina Cairo who says, thank you all. It was really great to listen to your stories. Wish you all the best for a brilliant future as writers. So that, thank you very much, Valentina. And uh, I'm still letting people in. There are people joining us or maybe they got disconnected and are coming back in. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other, uh, Nick, Nick Maturo, our technical host, who says, wonderful writing, everyone, grazie. And Maria Pia Spadafora, who was a student two years ago in my in-person workshop at the university. Thank you for these interesting, touching, humorous, fresh readings. Thanks to Licha and Mirko for organizing the second edition of this workshop that brings a burst of freshness and creativity to the University of Calabria. Thank you, Maria Pia, for being here with us today. It's a different experience to be on the audience side. Um, yes, so that, that was... Uh, it's wonderful to, uh, to be here and to have an audience, actually. I'm quite impressed, not only with the writers, the emerging writers, but I'm also impressed that people came because not, you know, c'est pas évident, as they say in French, that people would take time off from work or family or dinner time to, to come and listen to writers. Anthony, is, uh, yes. Anthony, you can unmute and ask your question. Anthony Portulese. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for those great readings today. It was great to hear all of them. This is more of a general question for whichever readers would like to answer. So it's not particularly tailored to anyone. For those of you for whom this was the first time doing a live performance, how does it feel now that it's done compared to what you expected it to be um, before having presented it to this group today? I'm just wondering if it was, if it met expectations, if you feel better, if you feel pretty much the same. Just curious how this experience has um, changed your perception of performing in front of an audience. So if anyone want, it feels comfortable speaking to that. So, Thanks for the question, Anthony. So who wants to go first? Simone. Um, I enjoyed it and my heart is still racing. So <laughs> I'm, I'm fine, but my heart is still racing. I'm still shaking, but I'm fine. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you, Simone. Anyone else? My, me? Isabella. Yeah, um, my heart is um, racing too, but it was such a relief and better than I thought. So, yes, I think that it was a success to me. <laughs> Thank you, Isabella. Anyone else would like to answer? Emma, are I'm you actually, here? I'm actually happy about how the whole thing turned out because my 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 whole body was shaking my voice was breaking but it didn't matter i'm happy that i did it i'm happy that i had the opportunity so thank you Licha. thank you mr Casagranda, for giving me the opportunity 
Thank you, Emma. Because, Thank you. Because if yeah. it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. Congratulations, you. Emma. Congratulations. Thank you. And you know what? I think that that being nervous, being anxious, having that sort of heart uh, racing and everything is part of the, um, it gives some, some, some quality to the performance anyway, some energy that, 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 that is, that has to be there. So yeah, it's a good part of it anyway. Otherwise you'll be, you would be like uh, too detached. I don't know. That was a way to show how passionate you are about what you do as well. So that, that's also important. And it's, it's also a way to um, let us feel what you feel as well. So that, 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 that's good. Yes, I agree. I mean, you're nervous. You were nervous. You're glad it's over. You did it. And you can, you know, congratulate yourself, pat yourself on the back. It's not everyone can speak at the microphone at an international Zoom event. And it especially is international. For, especially for the first time, you know. Especially for the first time, yes. And I can tell you from, you know, doing Zoom events, and I'm a lot older than you, I could be your grandmother in some cases, but uh, I'm, I still get nervous. Yeah. I st still get very sweaty just before. Let me tell you a secret. Teaching is also a sort of performance, so. Yes. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the beautiful thing about workshops is that, yes, a professor can say, I get nervous too about teaching. Yeah, but then I, I agree. Uh, I mean, when uh, Renata Ogero, Professoressa Ogero, what she said about um, like finding a new, a new you, a new, a new student or someone else, it, it, it's true because uh, that's something that was very impressive. Uh, I, I, yeah. I noticed the same because usually you have this sort of yeah, student teacher relation uh, teacher relationship uh, uh, when you teach or for the exams and that's it, especially at university. I mean, um, this was was different. So I'm glad. And I, I yeah, you know, the idea behind this workshop was to help students to, to, to find a voice and to express themselves and their creativity. And I guess that, well, first of all, uh, the, 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 the event has, has been proof of that. And uh, it was very nice also for me to, to, to see this other side of, of you. Um, so thank you for sharing that with, with us. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, maybe we have some more comments. Let's see. Uh, Liana, well done, all of you. Bravissimi. Thank you. Uh, compliment, uh, Benedetta Casella, complimenti a tutti. È stato molto interessante assistere a questo workshop. So, thank you. All right. Well, if there aren't any other comments or questions, I would, I would say goodbye. Mirko, what do you think? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we can. So, I'd like to thank all of uh, the students, our 12 emerging writers. I look forward to hearing more of your writing. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Casagranda and the University of Calabria for this opportunity. It's for me, it's been a really wonderful experience. And I'd like to thank Achenti Magazine and Elan Nick Maturo for providing the technical assistance. And I do want to say that this event is being recorded. Um, and as soon as the link is available on YouTube, I will send it to everyone and you can share with your family members or friends who were unable to attend given, you know, the time. So, and I remain available um, if you want to remain in touch. Don't forget what I said, one of the biggest tips, get involved. Now that you've done this, don't just like forget about it. Mm. Let it, let it go with it, you know go and grow with it so Mirko over one, to you. yeah one one last thank you and it's thank you Licia for for everything uh, and uh, you made this possible so uh, thank you for your passion thank you for your talent and the commitment um, it's been great thank you very it's much. my pleasure this was an exceptional beautiful experience for me the only 
you can only top it in person. So I look forward to the time when we can do it in person. Um, and you know, we, we had the Jessica Salerno who, who was at the first con uh, workshop mm. two years ago and who, you know, I'm still, I'm all boggled, you know, trying to figure out Jessica has already done the, this workshop and it's not for credit and she still came to the second one. So, you know, so we might see you again at the next one in person in two years in Calabria or in Montreal, who knows? Yes, no, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, part one and part two, Canada and Calabria. Yeah, a real yeah. international collaboration. Yeah, why not? That would be great. Um, yeah. So thank you again, Licha. That was thank you. Thank you. My wonderful. Pleasure. All right. So and thanks, thank everyone. you. And thank you. Um, sorry. Uh, We'd like to thank the students again. Yes, yes. And of well, course, the department and Elan, but I said that before, so. <laughs> yes, is there something else that we need to announce? This is where I usually make announcements at the end. Um, well, that would be the certificate, right? Oh, yes. Oh, we forgot to say that. That's pretty important. So the students don't get marks for participating in this workshop. Uh, they leave with a text that they created. And, uh, but uh, they get a certificate uh, from a Chanti magazine that states that they participated in a workshop, a 20 hour workshop with me, the editor in chief of a Chanti magazine. Uh, sorry, no marks, um, but, um, and no money either. Eventually though, remember, you're gonna, you, you know, you're gonna get paid for your writing and you're also gonna get paid to share your writing at the microphone. That's the way it's supposed to be. Um, yeah. Thank you. Was there anything else that I've forgotten? No. No. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm not sure if Liana is still there or can somebody take a picture of our gallery view with all, uh, I don't know if Sabrina, Sabrina might be driving, so. I can take a photo. Yes. Thank you, Liana. Go ahead. Everybody smile. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So we'll, we'll, we'll post that uh, and I'll send it to you as well. Feel free to write to me anytime. Grazie. Ci vediamo on the other. We're going back to our, our workshop. Okay. Just for five, 10 minutes. All right. Thanks okay. very much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bye. 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 Bye.